Thank you, Chris, for sharing with us this morning. Welcome back. We love you. Yes. And Cicero, thank you for jumping in there. We appreciate you, man. Amen. Belkis, right. you're not really prepared, but I'm going to ask you anyway to give us a little cheerleading when it comes to the play. Okay. Here's, here's where we're at so far okay. on, the, on the thingy bobby. It needs all the information, which we have to put in there. Okay. But it's a start. All right. right. Tell us what we should be praying for and how we should be looking. And well, at the end of the month, um, we're going to have auditions for, um, it's called Ebony Scrooge, uh, Modern Day Christmas Carol. Um, and, you know, our last play, I think the kids developed so many good, positive friendships. Um, and I just think it was it was just, it was so much fun. And I, we're just looking forward to that again. Um, so I'm just praying for, you know, the kids who are supposed to come, to come. Um, and the word to get out and, and hopefully just bring them into a, a, a place that they can, they can feel real positive and maybe build up their esteem. And, Amen. You know? And uh, we as a church... You know, we hosted them last time, and I think it was a, I think it was a great thing. So. Amen. 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 Yeah. And we had a lot of parents who came, and yes. they came to support their kids, but they also came and were influenced by the presence of God. Amen. And uh, we're that influence. This place isn't that influence with us, without us here, but with us here, this place becomes an influence because yes. we brought that influence Amen. in the person of the Holy Spirit when they come. Amen. 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 Well, it's great to see you this morning. I hope you're excited, and I'm looking forward to all the great things that God is doing. And uh, if you will with me, let's go in our Bibles together, because Lindsay's not here to do our announcements, so uh, Mary just kind of uh, shared with me a few small things. You're always invited, of course, on uh, Sunday mornings to attend uh, with us in our discussion. And uh, Leonard tells me it's going real well, so I, I was able to be encouraged by what he said. And he says everybody gets a chance to share what God puts on their heart. So that's good stuff. Amen. And uh, we're glad to hear that. All right. Um, how many know what we've been talking about these last few weeks? Anyone remember? <laughs> Being a witness. witness. Evangelism, right? Evangelism. That's all part of it, right? So uh, let me ask you a question here. Um, how many of you have ever um, gotten a ticket? Anybody? Gotten a what? Got a ticket. One or two for speeding. Yeah. Or, or some other some other conduct in your in your automobile. Well, uh, you know what I always thought was funny is uh, after almost every experience, I've always had the pleasure of having been told, "Have a nice day." Yes. Yep. You know, and I always wonder on the dash cam of the uh, of the officer if they don't just smile and laugh as they say it, because I know it's kind of hard to have a nice day when you just been presented with a ticket. We're being sarcastic usually. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I, but I, 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 I think it's a public courtesy yeah. that they I want that they want to let us know. But at the same time, it, you know, something about that just doesn't bless your name. But hey. I was reading in an article the other day about this little town in Waldo. Anybody ever heard of it? Oh, yeah. 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 And, and that they actually have a, AAA put a, a sign before you reach the, the area telling you that this is the country's um, worst speed trap. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, some bad news happened the other day. I found that, uh, that there was an investigation going on there because apparently the uh, entire small town's budget of about a million dollars is 50% uh, or more comes from court costs. Yeah, which probably in itself wasn't the worst thing. But what got them in trouble was recently they said, hey, our officers were told they need to write a ticket an hour. Every time they're on the clock, they need to write a ticket an hour. Well, just so you know, in the good state of Florida, that is illegal. You can't have crowd, you can't have quotas for your, for your ticket writing. So anyway, they're, they're, they're dealing with that. And I want you to keep that story in mind as we uh, go into this morning's word together. All right. How many of you pray for your friends, your family? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Jesus told us to do is, uh, is, is pray for people who use you. Uh, pray for your enemies. Yeah. That's right. And uh, I don't know about you, but that doesn't really excite me. I know I, I, I know I need to do that, but I can't say it's exciting to me. But we're going to talk about that this morning. And uh, we're going to talk about why, why would Jesus say that? I mean, was he just saying that just to prove how unspiritual we are and that we need you know, him to be able to think about praying for our enemies? 
let's see some of the things that really Jesus is talking about here. So I'm going to ask you, to, we're going to go to Acts and the fourth chapter. And it'll be a little while before we get there, but we'll mention several other scriptures along the way. But if you will, take the time to find Acts, the fourth chapter, and we'll look at verses 29 through 31. I think if you're like me, pretty much all of us are used to praying when and how we feel like it. In other words, uh, we have the luxury of praying for people we care about. We have the luxury of praying when we want to. But praying for your enemies puts you in a position where you're praying for something you don't want to and probably when you didn't want to do it. <laughs> Amen? Yes. Amen? That's what praying for enemies. And we, we, we become accustomed to the convenience of prayer and not the kingdom. The convenience of prayer and not the kingdom. Because when I pray for what I want, how I want, and when I want, it's kind of me-based, isn't it? Yeah. But when I start taking the kingdom first approach, and I start looking at why I'm here, which is what we're covering these many times together. Why are we here? And I'm sure you've heard me say and remember quite vividly that we're really here to be the light, mm -hmm. to be a witness. Not here just to love God. We could do that in heaven. We're not here just to glorify God. We could do that in heaven. We're not here just to sing His praises. We can do that in heaven. So there really leaves one thing that we must be here to do that we can't do in heaven. Just be the light to those who are lost. That's my life purpose. And if, if you haven't, I guess, got that, it, it's your life purpose. You're here for that purpose. So I want to try to be better at it. How about you? I mean, I, I feel like I love God. I, I feel like I worship Him. I, you know, I feel like He knows my heart. But what I'm not so good sometimes at is relating that to the world in which I live. <clears throat> so I'm trying to do better, and I'm hoping you are too. Amen. And these messages kind of help us yes. to be able to do some of those things better. All right. First of all, how do I pray for my enemies? How do I pray for my enemies? I mean, I... Now that Jesus said pray for your enemies, I think it's important we know how we're praying for our enemies. Amen. Just like you know. Amen. Yeah? Amen. Well, let's see some of the things that the Bible has to talk about praying for our enemies. So we'll know we're doing things right. Yeah. Amen? Amen. All right. So uh, one of those things is uh, when I pray for my enemies, usually I, I think of take care of them, God. Just... Rid me of that person. You know, it's kind of like Jimmy Hoffa, you know. I don't care how you do it. I don't care where you do it. I just don't want to see him anymore. You know, it just disappear. Make them disappear. That's kind of the way you think about praying for your enemies. So let's think about that. That's just us. Let's think about what Jesus said. And uh, God knows that it's impossible for us to hate people while we're praying for them. You can't hate on people while we're praying for them. Amen. It's just not yes. possible. Amen. You can't be talking bad about a person and praying pray for them. Amen. Doesn't work. Amen. 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 So let's see. Let's see some things that uh, that kind of change our attitude about prayer and about our enemies. In prayer, it's no longer us and them. Amen. Because suddenly, if we pray for our enemies, we realize they need Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. But here we are in the very same position in our own lives, right? Yeah. Saying, I need yeah. you, Lord. So suddenly our enemies are looked at differently, aren't they? Yeah. We're, we all suddenly come on the same need of <coughs> Jesus. We can actually see that our enemies have needs. It's not us and them. It's now about we. Yes. We need Jesus. Yes. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. In Ephesians 6 and 12, you don't have to turn there because I'm going to just quote it for you. It says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual, spiritual rulers of wickedness in heavenly places. Right? Yeah. These are the things that we wrestle against. Now, we see a person yes. that we identify with our struggles. Yes. But in all reality, what does the Bible say? That we wrestle not against flesh yes. and blood. Amen. That these people that, that we see antagonism come to us through, the people that we don't like, the people that we think don't like us, the people we're having conflict with, Man. the people that we consider enemies. Yeah, not the enemy. According to the scriptures, 
there's a hidden motivation. A force that is causing that person to act and be the way they are. Yes, amen. amen. Yes. Now again, we're looking at things totally through the eyes of Scripture, not through the eyes of my personal feelings. Yes. And I always say, yes, I know that people have a choice, and, and uh, I know that I'm not struggling against that person, but I wish mm -hmm. they'd make better choices. You know, I understand. That's, they're responsible for their choices, and yes, they are making choices that they're responsible for. But I have to understand that in order to solve the problem I'm encountering, I can't come at it head to head in the flesh. Amen. I've got to go to the source. Yes, amen. Now we're going to see some things here in the scriptures that help us to understand that this isn't just a, a, a higher up spiritual plane that I'm thinking about life. This is a true everyday experience yes. that people have that causes conflict yes. in relationships and life. All right, so we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and influences of evil that already are against God. Now, these people, according to the scriptures, people that, and, and even sometimes us, we can certainly be under the influence of the enemy if we allow ourselves. Yeah. So it's not unique to the world. We can understand, relate to the influence of the enemy tempting us. Yes. But it's a little bit different from their perspective because the scriptures literally say that the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not. Yeah. Okay? Now, in this world, we see with our eyes, but really, the blinding of the mind causes the ability, inability of the eyes to correctly see, Amen. to understand, to perceive. Everything becomes looked at differently yes. when there's blindness in the mind. Yes. When a person is under spirit, the spiritual influence of the enemy, the thoughts, the ways they perceive things, the very attitudes they have are influenced yes. by the enemy. Yes. Sorry. What the Bible calls the God with the little g of this world. All right, so if there's this blindness of mind, when Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Amen. In other words, there's an inability in their mind to comprehend that they're being used. Amen. That's it. They're being used by the enemy. Yes. The experience on the cross, and this is part of praying for our enemies. How did Jesus pray for his enemies on the cross? How did he do that? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. All right, so the first recognition that I have to pray for my enemies is forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. In other words, they are under spiritual blindness that causes every other thing that they see to be influenced by the enemy first. Yes. Amen. And it's going to take something else Amen. to yes. break that influence over their lives. Yes. Okay, are you getting that? Yes. Awesome. Amen. You're getting that. They're going to. It, <clears throat> okay, here's an example, right? Let's say you're blind. The Bible talks about the blind leading the blind, they both yes. go where? They, they, fall, they both fall into a ditch. It is yes. not possible for a blind person to lead another blind person. Why do I say that? Because a spiritually blind person cannot by themselves or even with the assistance of another blind person get out of what it is they're under the influence of. Amen. I hope this is clicking with you because when we talk about praying for our enemies, we're not just talking about how, we're talking about why. Yes. Not just talking about how, but we're talking about why. Yes. Like, the why is part of this, what we're saying right now, is that they cannot help themselves. Amen. So they need somebody who has the ability to step in where the enemy's influence is and to sever this connection yes. and power that they're under the influence of. Amen. Yes. 
Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual rulers, wickedness in high places. This is the place where we do our work. Yes, thank you, Lord. All right, now, have you ever gone from Florida to Georgia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I've gone to Florida to Georgia. If you haven't gone to Florida to Georgia, I encourage you to get out more. Yes. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not that far. It's just yes. a small trip right over there. Yes. But get out a little. But when you go to Florida and Georgia, you realize that uh, you see the big peach sign, Georgia, yes. peach, right? Yeah. Of course, when you're coming back, it's big orange, orange, you know, Florida. Anyway, when you go there, you 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 don't really like cross some different environment or, or whatever. You know, you're you're in the same kind of surroundings, but suddenly, what's changed? What's changed? Well, now every rule influence. that Georgia has, you are now subject to. Yes. Subject to. Yes, under Georgia. You're now responsible to follow the rules of Georgia. Yes. Just because you came in Georgia. Amen. Yeah. Right? I know that because the Amen. speed limit changes. The, you know, are you allowed to use radar detection devices? You know, they tell you all this stuff when you first enter in. You know, no radar detection is allowed in whatever state you're going in, you know. And so you got to abide by those rules. And if you don't, there's somebody there to tell you that hey, you've broken the rules and now you're going to get a ticket. Remember we talked about that little town in Waldo? Yes. Mm -hmm. When you first enter Waldo, I think the speed limit's about 50. It goes down to like 45. Yeah. It goes down to like 35. And then it pumps back down, up to 45. Then it goes back down to 35. Then it goes, I mean, it's a trap in order to keep you from being able to yes. actually stay steady. Obey the rules. Because there's just so many of them. They become <laughs> difficult. The average person can inadvertently break those rules. And then, of course, <laughs> ticket. Here's the thing. When we talk about the God of this world who has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, which the scriptures have given us, in case I didn't give you the thing, it's 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, if you should want to write that down. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it tells us he's blinded the minds of the unbelieving. So they're unable to see, comprehend, and understand the things of God. But, remember when I traveled over the border of of Florida and into Georgia. I'm still in the United States. I'm still an American citizen. I still have all my rights and privileges as an American. But you know what? I have to listen to that. All the rules that they have in Georgia. Yes. Here's the thing. Your enemies, unknowingly, by coming against you, have suddenly what's called entered into your sphere of influence. See, we like to keep people outside. We treat the field as, instead of it treating it as a mission field, we treat it as a mind field. Yeah. You know? yes. And we are apt to want to steer clear of anything that is discomforting or anything yes. that's uncomfortable for us. We treat our mission field, Jesus said, look up to the field because it's white in the harvest. We were looking at that field more as a mind field than a mission field. Amen? Amen. But Jesus said, the world that you're in is a field. Yes. And he said, it's a field for harvesting. Yes. It's not a dangerous place to watch everything you do and try to preserve your, your sanctity as a saint. Amen. Good God, please. Amen. Greater is he that's in us, saints. Yes. Amen. The world's not big and nasty and we're trying to keep it from coming into us. We've overcome the world. Amen. That's what the Bible said. Let's look at the world that we live differently. Thank it's you, not a minefield to be watchful Thank of. You, Danger is always waiting at every turn. Thank you, Lord. It's a field full of harvest. You're here to harvest. Yes. Amen? Amen. Yes. So here's what happened. When an enemy comes against you, when a person enters into your life, whether for good or for not, they have entered what's called your sphere of influence. 
which is absolutely necessary for you to be able to have any, any kind of influence in their life. See, even when they're your enemy, they have entered into your sphere, your circle of influence. And once they've entered into that circle of influence, your prayers become effectual in their lives. So we think about that only as like kids. You know, my kids are in my circle of influence. My wife is in my circle of influence. My friends are in my circle of influence, so I have the right to pray for them. You know who else is in your circle of influence? Your enemies. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. Your enemies are in your circle of influence. Yes. So now, this is God's way of bringing people who are adverse to his kingdom under his influence because of you. Now your prayers, your intercession, your actions can influence their lives. Yes. Wow. Amen. 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 All right, so let's see some more of that. Okay, now that we know that, that our, our, our enemies enter willfully of their own one accord, of their own accord, this is the key thing. It has to be something they do by their choice. So they have willfully entered into my sphere of influence. Sure, the conditions weren't the way I would have liked it, but they are now there. Yes. I got them. Amen. Now the way that I can begin to change a situation is that now my prayers, yes. my influence becomes effectual in their life. Yes. All right, so how do we pray for enemies? We learned about Jesus first. He's, those people entered his sphere of influence. Forgive them for they know not what they do. They entered into this sphere of influence. So Jesus did a strong influential prayer of forgiveness to these people. Amen. Do not hold this into their account. Amen strong, influential prayer by somebody who has influence within the people that have now entered willfully into their lives. Yes, thank you. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, if we go to Acts, and I know I turn, asked you to turn there a little time back, I'd like, to, I'd like you to see something, because the early church, you know, granted, I can't, I, I can't say they did everything right. You know, they would have had a bigger missionary zeal if they had done everything right. Yeah. You know? God turns Peter on to the whole, I'm, I'm really wanting the Gentiles to be equals with you now. Bring them on in. But he didn't exactly get that and, and keep it, you know. So that was one of the places where I, I think the, the early church could have, could have kept their missionary zeal. Um, but I'll tell you what. If we go over there to Acts, the fourth chapter, and uh, let me turn over there myself. <clears throat> I, I hope you, you wrote some of those scriptures down. Let me give them to you again. Ephesians 6 and 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen. That'll help you out to understand what, uh, what we're talking about. And then uh, I asked you to look at also uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. That helps you to know the God of this world is, is actively in the process of, of keeping people in mental blindness. Um, and now we're over to Acts, the fourth chapter, and the 29th through 31st verses, because the early church here, they, they began to pray because there was issues. In this case, they were told, don't preach in Jesus' name. Don't preach in Jesus' name. Now, you may have this come in the workplace. You may have this come in somebody's life. You know, you're getting along all well and good. You talk about the weather. You bring up the name of Jesus, and everything turns south. Anyone ever have that happen? Yes. Yeah, you just, you know, you, you think it's as part of the normal talk as anything, and then somebody else, like, they're, they're like, no, Jesus, where did that come from? I don't know what you're talking about. And suddenly there's this, you know, this conflict. Yeah. Well, here they told him, told, uh, they told these folks, no more preaching in Jesus' name, no more teaching in Jesus' name, none of this stuff here. Okay, how does the church respond to that? How does the church respond to that? So there's some, some opposition coming from the, the uh, traditional leadership. And, and please take this in the context. This can happen on your level. It's not just like you know, religious spirit against the spirit of God. You know, we're, we're talking just in everyday life. You're going to come across situations like this where 
your influence is trying to be diminished. And instead of caving to this diminishing influence that the world around you is trying to talk you into, to, to force you, intimidate you, the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear or intimidation, yeah. right? But of love, power, and a sound mind. There, this is, this is the, the rights we have to be here. We are not here just to take up space, live like everyone else, and keep it cool. Yeah. I don't mean go out and you know, stir up trouble for Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, when you know the enemy is trying to encroach upon kingdom territory, you need to recognize this is the place God's right. put me. He's mm -hmm. placed me here in this marriage, this relationship, in this situation for the purpose of being the light. Anything else is in opposition to God. Yeah. Praise God. All right, so yeah. looking at this early church act, reaction to the, to the influences in verse 29 through uh, 31. It says here that... Uh, I mean, let me move up a little bit. Verse 23, it says, And they being let go, they went to their own companions and reported what the chief priests and elders had done to them. In verse 30, I'm sorry, 29, this is their prayer. It says, Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Right? Point number one, verse 29. When, it, when, when the early church was, was praying for those that opposed them, for their enemies. Remember we're talking about praying for your enemies. A, we know that Jesus told us to do that. Yeah. Why did Jesus tell us to do it? That's the question we've had. We've learned that he's telling us to do it because when enemies come against us, they willfully enter our sphere or circle of influence. When they've entered our circle of influence, then suddenly the influence of God becomes influential Amen. in them. Yes. Amen. Whereas before, God was on the outside of the situation. They were governed by the God of this world who had blinded their minds right. of those who believed not. Then they've come in contact with a Christian who now has the name of Jesus to yes. use influence Amen. for the kingdom of God to bind up the communications between the enemy and that person so that person can think with soundness and clarity of mind, can see. The goodness of God. Yes, thank you, Lord. Here's how the early church started handling it. Look at what they did in verse 29. When they were opposed, the early Christians, they said, Lord, look at their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Yes. All right, point number one. When you have somebody coming against you, it's not the time to back down. It's time to go Amen. to your prayer closet and say, grant me more boldness to speak your word. No. Mm -hmm. Grant me more boldness to speak your word. But not just me alone did it say grant your servants. There's a principle I need you to understand. God is ambidextrous. God is ambidextrous. Yes. Everybody say that. Say God is ambidextrous. Okay, yes. you know what that means? You can use both hands. You can use both hands. Yes. Right? I don't know what it is if you could use both feet. But anyway, the idea here is that the body of Christ is bigger than any one person. When they, pray, when they prayed, they said, grant your servants boldness, that with all, grant your servants that they may speak your word with all boldness. There are other people, a part of the body, the left hand, the right hand, and everything in between, that you are praying for, God, bring those people. Jesus told us this. He said, about the harvest, he said, don't say there's so many days of the harvest, because you lift up your eyes, harvest is here. In other words, we live in a, in, a, in a earth that has a perpetual harvest. There may be times and seasons in the spirit, but this harvest is always ready. You may get some, you may get more, you may get less, but this harvest is always here. I've got to go by what Jesus said. This time, this place, this country, it's the place where the harvest is ready. <coughs> now with this readiness of harvest, Jesus said one thing. He said, pray for the laborers because they're few. Pray for the laborers. The problem isn't the word of God. The problem isn't God's arm short to save. We need to be praying for one another that we might speak the word with boldness. Yes. 
Amen? That's exactly what the early church did. When they got threatened, you, you, you do understand when, that, when I talk about the early church, I'm talking about the church as in the whole darn thing in its infancy. That is the entirety of the church. 120 plus a few, you know, a few folks ish. That's the entirety of the church at the time. And they're saying, pray, God, give us boldness that we might speak your word. Not just the disciples, not just a few leaders. Jesus is talking about the entire church, and he says, Church, pray for the church. Pray that they continue in whatsoever circumstance, situation they find themselves. To depend on God for boldness to proclaim the word even when there's persecution. We think of persecution as big time persecution. Like people giving their lives for the Lord. Paul said, I die daily. We talked about this last week. Don't think if you don't know how to die daily, you're going to know how to give it all up on the day that comes. You've got to learn how to die daily. <laughs> And don't think that the people that didn't give up their lives for Jesus didn't know how to die daily. Amen. Amen? So, we need to adopt a mindset, dying daily. Being able to say, not my will, but yours be done. Anyway, they are praying for the church that even when they're persecuted, there would be boldness to proclaim the word because the word, A, I, E, the gospel... The good news. Proclaim the good news. In spite of the fact that there's opposition to it or that there's, there's uh, resistance to it or that it's not acceptable. It is the only reason we're here and it is the only thing that gives salvation. The gospel. The good news. You don't, you don't always have to have chapter, verse, and bullhorn and you need to share the story because you are not only the good news in word, but you are the good news in evidence. Yes. You are proof the good news is reality. Share your life, your story. We talked about last week, your testimony. Yes. Sharing that. Because Jesus is the best news we have to offer. Amen? Amen. All right. So what happened now? They prayed for the body just like Jesus said they should. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers. So if you've, got a, if you've got a person that you're targeting in prayer because they've entered your sphere of influence, now suddenly you can bind the influence of the enemy from over their lives, knowing that they can't do that by themselves. Are you hearing? Amen. That's, what, that's what your enemies are now encountering. Amen. They've stepped into that, that, that circle of influence. Now you're praying for them. And you're saying, God, now I'm believing other people. Because God is ambidextrous. He does, just because you, as the left hand, didn't do you know, the, the bringing in of the harvest doesn't mean that you don't pray the person that is his right hand come to your aid and bring the gospel good news to them. Somebody else. God's got a lot of folks out there. and He's got folks who will do what we can't. But Amen. we should still be the ones to participate in prayer. Amen. 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 So, uh, 